In this video, we are going to finish our initial version of the quiz game by focusing on the logic of our trivia item component. So we have something currently that is not interactive. Uh, we're not getting any feedback about the buttons we've clicked, and there are a little, there are few quirks like um, there are these HTML entities in our data that we want to deal with. So we're going to learn how to shuffle our answers, get that interactivity in there, and deal with some of these small things like the HTML entities. The first thing that I want to do is actually step away from our trivia item component and do a demo uh, that will show us how to render arrays in. JSX. So this, what we did last time to just get something working where we copied and pasted a bunch and used our arrays and indexed into them to pull out each element one at, one at a time. This is a lot of repeating ourselves. This code is not dry. Um, so we're going to refactor this and learn how to do that in the React uh, way. So in the demos folder, let's create a new folder called arrays. And into this, I want to create a new file called todos.js. So for this, let's imagine that we are making a to-do application. So we're going to have some tasks that we want to render. Um, maybe make some tea, meditate, plan out the day. Go for a run. And we want to turn those tasks into a UL with LI elements. So let's create a component here. And I'm going to use my snippets to create a functional component with an export. Let's call this to do's capital T. And we can get rid of our import here. So we can manually create a list. And I'm just going to grab these. Well, you know what? Actually, let's not uh, we'll do this here. So I can create a list item, and we will just reach into that array, task 0 and copy and paste this and do one, two, three to grab each one. So just like we did in our game class, uh, our game component here where we created a variable that we put some JSX into, we can create an array that is built out of JSX. So we can take this tasks list and create our UL here and then just insert that array directly onto the page. So let's get this showing up on our application. We kept a demos page here. Let's add arrays, rendering arrays, and we will put our to do's there and hitting control space to bring up the autocomplete options, the IntelliSense options here to get to do's importing. So we should be able to go to our demos page and see that array rendering. And we have um, a little warning here that's telling us that each thing in our list needs a key prop. And it has more information here uh, from the React documentation about lists and keys. So inside of our elements where we, we're going to be rendering from an array, we want to make sure that each element has a unique key property. There are a couple ways to do this. Um, if we were building a to-do application, each of these would probably have an ID associated with it that it uniquely identifies that to-do. Uh, we don't have that in our demo, so I'm just going to use our index as the key here, which is OK, but you know not great. The key, how React uses this, is to identify elements if the content changes. So if this list element, um, like the first task, the test, uh, the task task, oh, the task text was edited by the user, um, the key is how React is able to identify which list item needs to be updated. 
So here, once I add those keys, that warning goes away. So, okay, we can create them manually, not really helpful, but it helps build towards the next thing that if we create a list dynamically, like with a for loop, we can still render that to the page. So instead of doing this, let's say we have task list items um, that is an array and we will loop for i from zero to tasks.length. Uh, well, i is less than task.length, i plus plus. So we're just creating a loop to go through each element in our array, and then we can push into our task list here a list item using tasks i and our key equals i. So this does the same thing that we were doing here. It just automates it using a loop. So we should be able to go back to our browser, refresh this, see our lists um, rendering. This is good. We are now at a place of it being automated, um, but we can make this a little bit better. So remember that lists have a, uh, or uh, arrays in JavaScript have a couple of functional methods. So arrays have functional methods for each, allowed us to loop over things. Map is going to allow us to transform an array into another array. That's the one we're going to use here. Some other ones, there's filter, which allows you to filter out elements, find, find index etc. There are a whole bunch that you can look into for arrays. So tasks um, are array dot for each would allow us to loop over and get the item and the index. And we could do a similar approach here to our loop. So we do our for each, which gives us a loop. We push into that the same markup as before, and our for each accepts um, three parameters, but the first one is the element from the array, so that would be our string, and then the second one is the index. So same thing here. We can now move on to map tasks, uh, task, list items equals tasks dot map so map is similar to our for each here it's going to have the same arguments the first two or the same parameters the first two are the item um, the current element from the array and our index and then what map has you do is return something new. So if I just return a list item, uh, let's put a placeholder in here. What this does is for each element in tasks, transforms it into an, a list item here. So now we've got four list items that all have test in them. And if we console log this, we can see our list of tasks got transformed into four objects here. This is the React representation of a list item. So instead of just mapping this to a list item that says text, we can put the item in there and we can set our key again using the index. There we go. Warnings are gone because we have our keys in there. So this form allows us to directly create that list of markup from some input list. This function is running on each element and transforming it into a list item. Okay, last one here. 
We can simplify this one step further. So our arrow functions, if we have multiple lines of code, um, we, set, we surround the function body with curly brackets and we use an explicit return to say that we're returning something. If we have a single line function that um, returns something here, we can write this in one line without the curly brackets and this one line form of an arrow function has an implicit return. So whatever you put on the right side here of your arrow is the same thing as this. It's a function that returns that. So this is implicitly set up as your return. So we can come out the, out, come out the old variable, our error, error goes away um, that was complaining that we had the same variable. And there we go. In one line, we have that list created. And if you want, um, what's common to do is actually to do some of this mapping directly in your markup. So we can open curly brackets here, drop in our map. And the only added wrinkle here when we're kind of doing this markup inside of our um, JSX area of our code is that you will wrap your implicit return usually in parentheses to make sure that everything gets picked up as being part of the return. My prettier extension inserted this for me. So when I pasted it in like this, it saved it, wrapped this in parentheses. But it has the same output here. And you can, of course, modify this. It doesn't just have to be an LI. You could return an LI that has like a checkbox and a label inside of it for like a full to-do app experience. But this should be enough for us to then work with map over in our trivia items. So in our trivia items, we have the correct answer and incorrect answers. And we want to bring them into an array, shuffle it, and then create a map here to transform each answer into a list item with a button. So let's create all answers. We are going to add the correct answer and whoops, um, spread the incorrect answers. So this is the array spread syntax where we are able to create a new array here and then use the spread operator to take an existing array, which inserts each element into our all answers. So if we console log this and go to the trivia page, we see all four of those answers in one array. And I have in the starter files from a couple videos ago, um, or I guess from last video in the common, there is a shuffle utility here which we've used previously, I've just added, you can copy it over from the quiz game. What we wanna do is get the shuffled answers using our shuffle on all answers. And I let it auto import here from common utils shuffle. So if we print out our shuffled answers, we should see um, these are rendered in random order. So five, uh, five, eight, six, four, four, six, eight, five. So it's random each time. So now we can come in here and do our map. So our map is going to take in an answer, you know, the element from the array and the index and we're gonna return. And here I'm going to use the um, explicit return syntax so that we can add some JavaScript here before we do a return. So I am going to return this. And now we can get rid of our list items. Give this a save so the formatter kicks in. 
we want to create a list item with a button and put the answer as text into that button. And let's put the key. Um, we could put the key as the index, but actually all of our answers should be unique. So in this situation, it's safe for us to use the answer as the key for the list item, which is a little bit better of a solution than using the index for the key. Okay, so this, every time I refresh, refresh here, we should get a different random shuffling, which looks like we're getting. Let's go ahead, now that we have our array mastered um, to optimize this code so that we don't have to hard code our index, let's go ahead and fix the problem that we have where some of the questions that we have have these HTML entities, these HTML escape codes, and get those rendering properly. So we're going to install a package called he um, here which is a package that allows us to um, handle those HTML entities. That's what he is short for. So we're gonna install this. And then when we use it, we can come down to the decode method that comes from uh, the he library. We pass in a string of HTML, which has these uh, entities. And what it does is decode them into um, the character references. So we actually get the Unicode characters in there. So I'm gonna kill my server, npm install he. And where we're gonna do this is inside of our trivia data. So eventually, you know, this stuff should be coming from our server and we're like fetching it from our code uh, dynamically. And then when we do that, our like uh, trivia loading code should go ahead and do this decoding to make sure that these characters end up being decoded properly. So for testing purposes, let's, uh, let's grab this question, move it to the front of our array so that we end up seeing this anytime we refresh the page. Oops, gotta restart my server. So this is just so that we have our test, um, our code to test immediately loading. So if we get our code working, we should see this loading the appropriate uh, quotation mark here instead of this HTML entity. So inside of this file, let's import the he or he library. And then let's use our fancy new mapping knowledge here to loop over our trivia data. And decode it. So we're going to get, whoops, trivia data. We're going to get an item from this map. And then with that item, we can return a transformed set of the data. So if I just do this item, we're spreading in all of the properties of each item in our array. So we're just making a copy of it. So if I do this and save it, um, we set our trivia data, the thing that we're exporting, to be a mapped version of our trivia data that just copies it without doing anything else. So our code should still work here. I should have no errors in the console. Um, nothing new has happened. But what we can do is the same thing we did with our state is, you know, we'll make a copy of all the properties and then we'll override the ones that need to be escaped. So our question we can say is equal to item question, but we need to do our decoding on it. And now as soon as we do that, the data that we're loading is this mapped version. So we get that quotation mark in there. And let's say that our correct answer, and we wanna make sure that we match exactly the field name here. 
So I'm just going to copy and paste it is equal to he.decode item.correct answer. And our incorrect answers, this one's a little tricky because we can't just decode the array. Incorrect answers is an array. We want to do an, another map. So we're going to do an inline map here where we say item.incorrectAnswers.map. So this expression takes our items, incorrect answers, runs the map on it, which gets one incorrect answer at a time, and transforms it using he.decode. So we should now be able to have these entities here and in our answers. And to test that out, I want to grab an HTML entity so let's grab this one and I'm just going to throw it into a correct answer and each of the incorrect answers. Just for testing purposes, that means we should see all of these get properly decoded. Great. Okay. So I can undo that, save this, and let's add a little comment that this operation should be done when we import or when we retrieve our trivia data from the server. And this is currently just being done in our data file. So we've got our entities loading. We've got our shuffled answers. So the next thing to do would be to focus on the interactivity. If we go back to our whiteboard, the interactivity is that our buttons show up in their default kind of clickable state. Our next button should be disabled and should look disabled. And then when we click on one of these, the thing that you click on needs to turn to either red or green if you got it wrong or right, respectively. The other buttons need to be disabled, and then our next button needs to be enabled. So we need two pieces of state to be able to do that. One, we need to detect when one of these buttons has been clicked. So we'll have a Boolean that tells us whether we're in this state or whether we're in this state. And then when we, when we actually have clicked on an answer, we need to store which one we've clicked on so that we can use that to go ahead and color code that. Did they click on the right answer? Did they click on the wrong answer? So let's flip back to our code here and work on the trivia item. So we're gonna create uh, two pieces of state. Let's do it up here. Selected answer, set selected answer. and use state. Um, we'll start this off at null to mean that we are saying there's intentionally no value here. You haven't selected an answer. Uh, and I think I misspoke. I said we're going to create two pieces of state. Actually, what we're going to do is just create a piece of state that's kind of derived from this. So we know whether or not you've picked an answer. If this variable is no longer null. So selected answer does not equal null. If the selected answer is anything other than null, you know, we know true, we have picked an answer. If it is equal to null, then, you know, false, it, we have not picked an answer. So what we need to do is make sure that we are listening for when this button's click event is triggered. Let's make sure this is working by printing out the event.target.innerHTML, which is what we used in the, the basic version of the quiz game without React. 
So when this is clicked, when any of these buttons that is rendered on that are being rendered onto the page here using our map are clicked, this function should run. So we should be able to click and see the inner HTML of that answer printing out here. And because we know what the correct answer is from this prop, we can also, you know, check, you know, was that event.target inner HTML equal to the correct answer? False, false, true, false. So now we know both the select answer and whether we were correct or incorrect. So let's get this state working here. Let's set the selected answer to, um, and actually we'll break this out into another variable. We'll say const player answer is equal to this, and then we will put the player answer in here. And we will was player correct. Eventually we will use this piece of information. So I want to, I want to keep it here in our function. This needs to be sent back to our game eventually so that the game knows whether the player was correct. But for now, we'll just print it out to the console. Let's add a console log here. Selected answer has picked answer to verify that these two things are working. So if I click on checkers, we should have this print out again and we should see, um, I think I accidentally hit the space bar. Um, so it checked it twice. So we've got checkers printing out as our selected answer, has selected answer is true. If I refresh it and we click on um, the correct answer, we should see um, that print out. So it looks like our logic is working there, but one of the things you'll notice is that as I'm clicking, the answers are being reshuffled, which is a very bad user interface here. It's hard to tell what we just interacted with because they're flipping around. The reason why that's happening is because our state is mutating every time we click one of these answers, which reruns this code for our shuffled answers. So there are a couple of ways that we can fix this. The way that we're gonna use in this version is we are gonna use some state to store our shuffled answer. And we could pass in shuffle all answers to use state. What that does is only use this value when setting the state initially, and then any other time this renders, that initial state is basically ignored. So this shuffle is happening every time, but it's only being used that first time. Whoops. Um, I forgot that this, you know, we, we get the shuffled answers and we get a like set shuffled answers function. Make sure I got those destructured properly. And now this should show up. And as we click that shuffle, you know, that initial value um, doesn't influence what's on the page. This is only picked up at the beginning. But this isn't like a great structure because we're shuffling every time and there's no need for us to shuffle every time. So another way that we can do this is use state allows you to pass in a function and it will invoke that function only when the state is being set up for the first time. So here, this shuffle only ever runs the first time our state is set up and is ignored every other time. So it's kind of an optimization here so that we don't have to run this shuffle operation every time. And that's working.
In future versions, we would probably want to change this slightly when we learn about use effect to sort of implement this in a more foolproof way, but this is fine for now. So we can add a little note here. Use state can take a function that is run only when the state is initialized the first time. Well, that's redundant. I can just say initialized. And if we want, we don't actually need the set shuffled answer. We're not using that anywhere in this version. So we could just do update our destructuring to just grab the first element. So this should still work. We're seeing our selected answer printing out, and we're seeing whether or not we have picked an answer printing out next to it. So we have enough information now to start doing what we whiteboarded. We now know whether we're in this state, you know, whether we've picked have not picked an answer or whether we have picked an answer. So we can start working out our styling. And we know that from our previous version, we have these three classes here. We have trivia item disabled, correct, and incorrect for styling those different states. So we have disabled for anything that needs to appear disabled incorrect for the red, correct for the green. So what we need to do here is change what classes we're applying to be one of these three. So I'm just gonna leave them here for reference. or we can call this class name. We're gonna start it off as this string, stored in a variable. And if we are in the situation where this button needs to be disabled, we'll throw that into the class name. And if it's incorrect, we'll throw that in there. And if it's correct, we'll throw that in there. So the first thing we need to do is figure out whether an answer has been picked. So if answer, uh, what do we call it? Uh, has picked answer, then we know we're gonna need to apply these because we only need to mark the feedback after the user has picked an answer. So we've still got that here. We can get rid of this console log. If they have picked an answer, then we need to know whether or not to display disabled, incorrect, or correct. We display disabled when the button is one that they have not clicked on. So let's create a picked this answer variable that is comparing whether this answer that's inside the button, you know, this thing that we're pulling from the loop, is equal to our selected answer. So is it the thing that we stored in our state that they clicked on? This will be true if they picked this answer, false if they didn't. So if um, picked this answer, we'll do one thing. Otherwise, we will take our class name and we will add space disabled to it. So the space is important because if we didn't have the space, we would have basically be adding this one giant class name. They need to be space separated. So making sure that when we add this to our string, we add a space and we should be able to test this and see that as soon as we click on an answer, the rest of them become disabled. We'll have to make sure that we don't you can see that I'm clicking now and getting, I have the ability to change my answers. So let's fix that. Let's make sure that this button is disabled when has picked answer. Disabled is the HTML attribute. If it's true, that button no longer fires events um, and can't be interacted with. 
and we're just using our Boolean here. So that should mean that now I can click on one of these and I can't click on any of the others. Uh, and I also can't click on this one to select it again. Nothing else um, is changing with our app. Our state isn't changing. So it looks like these buttons are disabled properly. Let's go ahead here and we now need to check if we picked this answer, is it correct or incorrect? So actually, I'm going to move this up here. Um, I'm going to create a variable, is this correct? So is the answer that we clicked on, um, or sorry, is this answer associated with this button equal to our correct answer? So if we picked this answer and this is the correct answer, then we can take our class name and add in correct. Let's add an else if we picked this answer and it is not the correct answer. Class name is, we'll add on the incorrect here. So we could do this with a nested if structure. Um, I just find this a little bit easier to flatten out into three branches. So we have picked correct, picked incorrect, and this last one should be uh oh no this last one's fine as else um, because all of this is inside of our if we have picked an answer and because i think i can fit all of these on one line let's see uh no i'll leave this with the explicit code blocks Okay, so now we should be able to click on wrong answers and have them highlight in red. And if we refresh the page and click on the correct answer, it highlights in green. All that we're doing here is just conditionally changing what classes are in this uh, class name variable. Let's work on the next button now. So this next button is not disabled when the page loads. So we want to make sure that we actually disable this next button so that's only clickable after you pick an answer, which would match our wireframe here where this is disabled and then it becomes enabled. So down here, we can do a similar thing. This is disabled when you have not picked an answer. So this is the inverse of our answer buttons. So right now, clicking on it, nothing's happening because this button is disabled. I can verify that by just inspecting it here and looking and seeing the disabled attribute. But we, we do want to update the styling here. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to grab the class name and bring it up into a variable because it'll be a little bit easier to manage here. So I'm going to say the next button classes, class name equals this and let's make this a mutable variable so that we can add in the disabled um, this class here so if we have picked an answer or how do we want to do this Ah, if we have not picked an answer, then we will go ahead and add in our disabled. So it starts off, it's always going to be our button. It's always going to have, have this uh, next button class as well. And then we want to conditionally only when we haven't picked an answer yet, ha make it look disabled. So now we can take this next button class name and throw it in here. And our next button should both uh, functionally be disabled 
and visually look like a disabled button. So disabled until we click, um, and then we should be able to move on to our next question. And let's, let's fix this bug while we're at it. You can see that um, as I'm clicking, these answers are still from our first question, but the rest of the stuff is changing. So what, what's happening here is that our React application, when we put this trivia item on the page, there's always a trivia item component on the page, and React is saying, well, you know, there's no key here, so when a new one is loaded, I'll just pass the question in the new prop to that existing trivia item. If we go ahead and say that the key is equal to our trivia index, so this is unique for each trivia question that we have, um, because each one is in a unique position in that array, that should make it so that React recognizes that when we um, change from one index to the next, that actually means, you know, get rid of that previous trivia item component, throw on a new one that has all of the new properties in it. And this will be important when we do animation um, to make sure that we actually have two separate trivia items, one that we can fade out while the other is fading in on the page. If we don't have that key there, we can't do that kind of nice transition between trivia items. All right, so the last piece here is we need to make sure that um, this interactivity on the trivia item communicates properly with our game so that score can be updated. So if I were to get this right, um, 21, our score should go up, but it doesn't. So if you remember back to our whiteboard from the last video, we talked about these communication strategies. From parent to child, we pass the data down as props. So that's how our trivia item gets its question, correct answer, incorrect answer. Those are just passed down from game. And we now need the flip. We need the child to tell the parent about something. And the way that we've done that twice now is to pass in a function from the parent to the child. So if we go back to our game, we need a function here. Uh, let's call it on answer selected that is told was the answer that was picked the right answer or the wrong answer. So this will accept a Boolean, was player correct? If we were correct, then we can set the game state to be our previous game state with the score overridden to be score plus one. So this function, we're going to have to go ahead and create it as a input to our trivia item in a second. But this we're saying is a function takes in a Boolean value, true or false, and that true or false should tell you whether the player was correct in picking their answer. If it was correct, we can go ahead and bump up the score by one. So let's pass that in. We're going to say on answer selected is equal to our variable. So we just need to go into our trivia item, create a on answer selected function um, as a property. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I update my JS docs while we're working on it. So this is a function that takes in a Boolean and returns nothing. So on answer selected, we can go ahead and this is where we want to invoke it. We are running it when the on answer click is run. And remember, this is being added to our buttons on click handler here. So when the answer is clicked, we know whether or not the player was correct by just comparing what they clicked on to our correct answer. And we can notify the game about it here. So we can get rid of this console log and let's check out here 
let's add a console log here. We were told, or the game was told, that the player was answer, and let's also print out was player correct here. So we should see this message anytime we click on an answer, and we should see true or false to know whether we were right or wrong. So let's try getting it wrong. Click checkers. Game was told that the player picked an answer. False for it being the wrong answer. Let's try it again with the correct answer. Game was told that the player picked an answer. True, it was the correct answer. And you can actually see our score went up. So each time now, if I go and get it right, oh, let's try that again. What is the answer here? There we go. Uh, score went up from one, zero to one, one to two, all the way through. So we can get rid of this. We now have our um, logic of the trivia items set up. So this should be all done. Just taking a quick glance to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Can remove some of this white space here. Okay, this looks good. We have all of our trivia item and its interactivity set up. The one thing that we need to add to kind of string all of this together is remember we set it up so that if you um, click all the way through, you get to the last question, you click through, it is trying to increment the index and we go outside of the bounds of our array and we have no data to load, so it breaks. So let's set this up so that it's easy to test. The first thing I want to do is um, I'm going to add a line here, trivia data equals trivia data dot slice zero two. So this allows me to trim um, or slice two elements from the array. I'm grabbing the zeroth element and the uh, first element. So we should see one of two questions because we have sliced that here before we export. So anyone that imports it is just getting those first two questions. This is just for testing purposes so that we can really easily get to the place where, boom, it throws an error. So our problem is that we want to make sure that when we go to load the next question, we don't just um, indiscriminately increment the index. What we want to do is only increment that index if we have hit, um, if we are, if we have room left in the array. So another way that we could phrase this is if the trivia index is greater than or equal to the trivia data dot length minus one. So are we at the last index in the array. Remember that length gives you the number of things in the array, but since we count from zero for index for indices, got to subtract one here. So are we at the last index or are we beyond that? If so, then we can set the game state to be is game over true. So we're not going to increment the index. Otherwise, we can do what we were doing before. And this can be moved on to a single line. So if we ran out, if we're on the last element and we try to load the next question, game is over, which should dr trigger our page content to switch to the end screen. Otherwise, we can go ahead and increment the index. So with that in place, we should be able to get this right, get this right, end up on our last screen that tells us that, you know, we killed it, got a score of two. Um, we still have to add that like best score feature, but we got a placeholder there and we should be able to retry the game um, and go back through, get it wrong and end up with a score of zero and, you know, retry as many times as we want. So we can untrim 
here our data. So let's just say just for testing purposes. We should be back to the full 10 questions and the same thing should work. I can click through and randomly get some of these right or wrong and got a final score of three. So we did it. We we built the quiz game. We you know we added a few features as we were moving through here, like our next button um, into this React version of the game. But you should now have like side by side an HTML, CSS, JavaScript version and a React version that you can kind of compare and contrast. And hopefully, what you found is that moving to this structure, where we're able to divide up our application into these reusable components and these components that can have their own state associated with them that this is um, you're, you're sort of seeing that this is a more maintainable more modular way of doing things versus our previous html css javascript approach where it was all the html in one file all of the javascript in another file and had to kind of make sure that the ids and everything stayed in sync um, this version that we're working on in React is, is easier for us to extend um, and continue building further as we continue in this course. So now that we have this basic version built, uh, we kind of have a complete front end for our application, and we can now start thinking about the back end of this application. So we can hook up a database and we can load our questions from a database and then we can create user accounts so that a user can log in and have their, their scores, their stats saved to their account and they can create quizzes um, and store quizzes. So all of that is coming up next.